What's up, everybody? This is Grant at Cause Artist. Today, we chat with Max Rivest, who is the co-founder of Wise Monkey, which is a coffee tea leaf company. And if you don't know what coffee tea leaf is, you're not alone because I had no idea either. But it's a really innovative approach to how to create a whole new business industry around coffee. So coffee is usually harvested for only three months out of the year. Um, so a lot of coffee harvester workers only, you know, have three months to, to make their money. And then they have to sort of migrate to different villages or areas to try to find more work. And their children have to change schools or be out of school or drop out of school to help them work and, and just pay for, for everyday uh, living expenses and things like that. So what Max and, and his co-founder did was uh, discover a way to take the uh, coffee plant and harvest it again to make tea. Um, so you, I would take the coffee beans off the, the coffee plant to make coffee, and that's fine. But then they were just throwing all the leaves away um, from these coffee plants. And so what Max and his team did was was uh, went down uh, to, to Mexico and South America and tried to figure out a way to harvest these leaves from the coffee plants to make tea. And, and in turn, that creates 12 months of employment for people and, and the stability for 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 their kids to to go to school, uh, further their education, um, so and and create a whole economic industry around uh, coffee tea. Um, so it's a really innovative conversation because I learned tons, <laughs> uh, and I love coffee, and I'm starting to to love tea a little more. And this is kind of a, a really good conversation around two things that I really like. So I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, I hope you find it as interesting as I did. And uh, yeah, read up more on what the coffee tea leaf is and, and what Wise Monkey is doing and Max and his team are, and, and really support them and what they're doing. And, and there's a massive social impact component behind this when you talk about employment, education, um, economic returns. So hope you enjoy it. So let's start with what the actual coffee tea leaf is and then we'll kind of get into how everything started but i think it's good to to understand what the product actually is yeah so i mean essentially the we were in school in in france and we came across a study about the coffee leaf and you know apparently it's been consumed for hundreds of years in ethiopia it was uh, a cultural staple in lots of other tropical countries, but not necessarily as a tea, but also used as like a like a pumice for different uh, inflammatory issues. And we just were really intrigued by this for our entrepreneurship project and part of our master's. And the more research we did, the more we realized that it's actually been around a long time, but was never really well documented or, or in never like really innovated in terms of its kind of final format and, and how it was processed. And so we kind of had a hunch. We were like, well, if every other beverage in the world, you know, that's really good is typically fermented somehow or crafted somehow, then why can't we do that with the coffee leaf? And, uh, and then we realized that the coffee industry can only be, can only harvest the bean for three months a year. So the rest of the year, most of the industry is out of work. Mind you, the people that still are there working are cutting off the leaves and then just tossing them away. So we kind of put two and two together. We're like, all right, well, if we can actually make like a decent recipe out of the leaf, you know, and it actually tastes good, it has mar- like just you know has market success, then that means that we can create a year-round economy for the coffee industry, which right now is aggressively in peril. Um, you know, no one's making money making coffee. That's why they're abandoning their crops, and a lot of them are trying to migrate north to the U.S. It was something that we really, you know, we saw the potential there, not only for a cool product to bring to market, but also to solve a massive issue in the industry. And I spent a lot of time in Latin America growing up. So for me, it was kind of a way to, you know, to pay respects and and try to find a way to just contribute something in return versus just being a tourist and, and enjoying everything and the people. And, you know, outside of just bringing tourist money down, it's like doing something really legitimate that you know, has actually a global impact. You know, we've inspired about about four to five other companies around the world that are starting to pioneer uh, coffee leaf tea in their respective regions. So it's creating like its own movement right now, which is really fun to see because we are, you know, the first ones that really got it onto the onto the market and, and in the media. So now it's starting to take off in its own right. But uh, essentially, the product itself, it's the coffee leaf that we've crafted like a black tea, for example, similar method 
just a different leaf altogether. And so at, at the end of the day, the, you steep it like a regular, you know, tea with hot water and it tastes super smooth. It doesn't taste like tea in the sense where it's like bitter or astringent. It doesn't have any of that. It's actually so smooth and it's even lightly sweet just on its own. It's got lots of body to it and it's lightly caffeinated. So you can have, you know, two, three cups, no problem. And you won't like, you know, it won't keep you up at night like a coffee would. Um, but it does have some caffeine. So it has good energy and clarity, but it's not something that will like, you know, make you jump out of your seat and, and then have the jitters right. all day, like a, like a strong coffee would. So it's very much like a tea format, but it comes from the coffee plant. It has its own unique taste and, uh, you know, and it's employing, you know, over 120 people throughout the off season that wouldn't have jobs otherwise. Where were you getting your master's degree at when you, when you found out about it? We were in Bordeaux, France. I grew up in North Vancouver and I went, I did my undergrad a, f a few hours away from Vancouver. And then after that, I worked for a couple of years in Vancouver at a finance company and just really hated what it was all about. You know, I got hired after taking a different job and then quitting because it was just like no pay and there was really nothing. So I, f I fell back on the original offer, which was like corporate job and like an industry I don't really care about, but it was like, okay, well, I got to pay off my debt somehow. Right. Sure. And within a week I was already looking for another job. I was like, okay, this is going to be our long road ahead. So it's just like try to get ready for the next step already. And couldn't really break into anything I really loved. And there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, you know, marketing design happening in Vancouver at the time. And so eventually I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to take everything I've saved and go to France for a master's. Um, I have a French passport. My mom is French and I was kind of losing my French. So I figured I should go now before I get too old and I'll <laughs> lose my French forever. And then sure enough, like we, we just, Arno and I became kind of buddies at school. And, and then, uh, and then in the second semester we had that project and then that's how Wise Monkey started. So the project was to create a fictitious company. And this is what you guys decided, or was it based around the food industry, the coffee industry, and, and you just discovered via research? It was global entrepreneurship. Okay. And and my undergrad, it's kind of hard to explain. It's it's like a totally hybrid degree. My undergrad was a Bachelor of Tourism Management, but realistically, it was half a business degree, and then the other half was tourism under the sustainable uh, cultural tourism kind of thing. Like, Interesting. Like, yeah, like we had like cultural cultural sensitivity courses. Uh, I went to Chile, learned and did some Spanish courses there. We did uh, indigenous uh, sustainable tourism consulting, and so a lot of it was international marketing, and a lot of it was about sustainability. So in my undergrad, and, and social impact, of course, and so my undergrad was already kind of aligned with that. And then when we figured out that the industry was so seasonal and volatile, and we could make an impact, I was like, I was sold. I was like, this is unreal. Like if we can figure this out. It's going to change the industry forever when and you, impact million, millions of people's lives. Yeah, it's it's crazy just the amount of impact you guys made so far in just a few short years. Um, I mean, it's going to be incredible over the next decade. When you guys first had the idea, I read, I guess, I guess you sort of discovered it through <clears throat> research and maybe did a report on it. And then what was the next steps, though, from I have this idea, this is really interesting to actually going to do it? I think the the main driver for us was like it was the end of the school year was in June where we presented the project but but by like March I was already convinced that I was going to pursue this my you know my whole family's entrepreneurs I've always been like freelancing and having side jobs like my first job was like you know doing the paper delivery and then you know, washing cars and, and then working at bike shops, you know, when I was like working for store credit, like I've always been, you know, trying to drive value and, and, and learn on my own, at least in some respects. And I've always been waiting for like the right idea. And, I've, and my background was I was supposed to go into engineering, actually, and then I completely did a 180 and I went to tourism <laughs> and, sus and sustainable development. So it's always like I was always like waiting for like this perfect like tech idea or like, you know, like a cool design product that would just like solve problems, all this stuff. And I was like, you know, I, I had some ideas, but to even get it done, I'd have to raise a ton of money. You know, I didn't have an engineering degree. So I was like, there's no way that'll work. So I was always kind of waiting for like the perfect, you know, I don't know what the word is, like the perfect kind of target in a sense where it just fits everything, where like it checks all the boxes in terms of, you know, is it on trend? Does it solve problems? 
uh, is, would it be a great product? You know, hypothetically all this stuff. And this started, you know, really showing that it was going to have some really, really good potential for all those things. And, and to be honest, like the more research we did, you know, we connected with the original researcher that did the study and published it and all this, the more that we contacted her, the more that we kind of kept scratching at the surface, we had these doors open of like free information or like intro to this person that could help us. And all these things just kind of kept happening. And we were like, I don't know, man, it's a sign, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's a lot of times you have like a project at school. I mean, basically for me, it was every other time, you know, you have a project at school and you're like, you can kind of dive your passion into it and like really get into it. And then you hand in a paper and then you get a mark and you're like, all right, cool. Like, I guess that's it. Like I'll never, I know that topic now, but I'll never touch it again, you know, so who cares? And for us, it was like, well, we could actually go do this. And and for my co-founder, a lot of his motivation was like, he grew up in, in the Bordeaux area where it's known for the best red wine in the world. And he's about, he lived about 20 minutes away from Cognac as well, which is, hmm. uh, you know, Cognac region. And so for him, it was like everything fermented beverages was around him. And his his actual uh, major in the master's degree was wine management, and what and mine was international marketing. So he was already kind of looking at the beverage world pretty seriously, and uh, eventually it just kind of came down to like, okay, well, if we want to go innovate a new beverage category, and also you know have like a really cool healthy product that creates massive social impact, you know, we kind of have the best setup to do that right now, and we figured especially at the time, it was like 2013 when the, uh, the European economy was absolutely crumbling. Like I think in Spain, like 50% of the people under 25 were unemployed, Mm -hmm. you know, and it was worse in Italy and France was catching up quickly. It was getting pretty bad. And we're like, Hey, well, you know, I can keep applying to like Ernst and Young and PwC and all these consulting companies. Or I was even trying to apply for like Quicksilver and and all these other cool like you know Rip Curl like yep. lifestyle companies that weren't too far away from us. But the more time I spent on applications, the more time I was like I'm wasting so much energy in all these custom applications right. for a job that even if I do get it, I'm gonna I'm gonna get paid like 400 euros a month and my rent will be like a thousand euros a month and there's a good chance that I have to go to like Paris and live there or somewhere else. And I didn't really want to live in a big city. Uh, I was pretty happy being, you know, by the, you know, not far from the water in Bordeaux and kind of a chiller city. Um, and at the end of the day, it was like, well, you know, I'm going to try and chase these jobs that don't really pay anything. And then eventually you have like, you're really stuck in that ladder kind of track. You can't right. exactly, can't exactly move into different divisions and then really you know, break your own niche out. And me being just, you know, fairly entrepreneurial, I think from, from my, my adolescence, uh, it just didn't really line up. So I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to, I'm not applying for this crap anymore. It's a waste of time. And so I just dove head first into wise monkey and just worked on it every single night, basically. And it's funny. Cause like as a school, like I never took a school project so seriously, but I also saw it as like, okay, this is the opportunity where I have a lot of extra time. I can use the professors at school to get feedback and mm-hmm. then maybe get a few connections here and there to get a little bit higher level feedback, like more people that are in the business space versus just uh, professors. And that's what we did. You know, we leveraged our opportunity. We spent as much time as we could on it and we got as much feedback as possible. So then that that way that, you know, we were when we were done at the end of the year, we had something that was at least like at least halfway actionable in terms of you could go and start this and you at least have like a vision and a plan that's all together. And it's not just like a, you know, totally off the, off the cuff, like flying by the seat of your pants. I guess an inspiration can take you a bunch of different ways. So how did you, how did you guys condense it into focus and eventually find out about the growers in Nicaragua and sort of the, the coffee, the coffee bean harvest being three months and then the sort of local economy there having to be displaced, you know, trying to go find different jobs in, in different villages and stuff like that, because there's this nine month block where nothing was being sort of done. So how did the shift move to Nicaragua and pun intended, putting some seeds in the ground and <laughs> and, try, and, and planning, planning the actual business there? Yeah. So we like throughout the the winter when we were basically just creating the whole project, we were looking for, we, we basically, to get this started, we had to find a tea company, whether it's like traditional tea, uh, w- which is from Camilla Sinensis plant, which is like a black tea, green tea, et cetera. We had to find a 
a company making tea that's either that or like herbal tea, like mint, et cetera, like just dried herbs in a coffee region. Hmm. And the only places in the world that typically would do that are Southeast Asia and then in Africa. But considering that North America was going to be where we were going to start and considering that both him and I spoke uh, Spanish, we're like, okay, well, let's we ha- let's obviously try in South America first or Central America. So we called tea companies like from Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, et cetera, like basically all the Latin countries uh, that grow coffee. And eventually, you know, it came down to this one group in uh, in Nicaragua that was small enough to be, you know, open to doing something like this. And also curious to see, you know, how we can create some impact, et cetera. So we said, okay, we got, we at least have like a, a place that has machinery that can dry the leaves, you know, like whatever, whatever they have, we just need something that, you know, some expertise around that. And then if they can also put it into tea bags, that would be a bonus. So, and the, and the, what's funny is that I actually heard, I actually already had been to Nicaragua twice before. Uh, the first time was after a surfing trip in Costa Rica. And then the second time was after a consulting gig in Chile that I already mentioned. So I was like, Hey, well, I've already been there twice. I know it's safe to travel and the people are amazing and it's just a beautiful country. We, we have to go like, this is another one of those things where it's like another sign, you know what I mean? Where it's like, Oh shit. Like now, you know, I can't say no to this. We decided to go down there and we met up with the team and they said, okay, yeah, like, awesome. This is a good idea. And, and then, uh, they connected us with a few growers, but it wasn't really anything substantial. So it was really up to us to like go knock on doors and find coffee growers. And it's, it was really hard. Cause like at first we got this PDF document of like all the growers in Nicaragua and their, and their phone numbers. Mm. The problem was, the problem was that the, the directory was outdated by a few years. And within those few years, at one point, they added a digit to everyone's phone numbers. So right. none of the numbers were useful. <laughs> so it's like, wow, like, you know, so convenient, right? So we thought we had like this perfect, like, sh- golden sheet, we just call like 50 growers and, and leave messages and see what happens. But yeah, so it turns out we did it the old school way. Um, we went to a bunch of co-ops, the fair trade, organic co-ops, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. We did our first batch with one of the regional growers in one of the co-ops. We traded a, you know, basically what was about, if I have to do calculations really quickly, what was about 85 kilos of, of uh, fresh leaves. We traded for a, a nice bottle of rum, basically. Nice. Because there was, there was no real monetary value on it. And like even they didn't know how long it would take to like harvest or whatever. So we're like, okay, let's just do this like small little run. And then we'll just give you like a nice bottle of rum and we'll go out for a night and, and we'll hang out at the farm. And uh, it was a really fun night, actually. It told us a lot about how the co-op operates. Um, some things that won't, I won't mention on this call what, that were pretty surprising. Um, so, we, we, you know, at, we did our first batch. We tested the, the tea. And at that moment, <clears throat> right before testing, we were like shaking because it was just like, if this is no good, you know, <laughs> we're screwed. <laughs> We've wasted all this time and money, uh, you know, running on credit cards. Like we didn't have, we weren't bankrolled at all at this point, you know, we were running on credit cards and whatever we could get. So fast forward, uh, about, uh, two or three weeks later into our trip and I got bit by a dog at a waterfall, like kind of a tourist site. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the owner of the dog, we saw him a week later and he's asking us what we're doing in, in the country. And we're like, Oh, it's like, Oh, we've got this coffee project. And he's like, Oh dude, my uncle's like an amazing grower. You got to meet him. And so a week later we meet him and, uh, and then we start working with him for about a year and a half. Eventually it wasn't scalable and he started ripping us off, which is unfortunate because he was actually a pretty smart guy, but he just like totally saw an opportunity to just rip off two young gringos that, sure. you know, pretty yeah. out of context. And so <clears throat> we started looking around for another grower. We met an amazing coffee buyer named, uh, Amanda, <clears throat> and she introduced us to Enrique, our, our now now our third founder. And uh, we met, we went to his farm. It was unbelievable. It was like it was like it's light years beyond any other farm. Like they have their own massive facility to to process everything in house. They have concrete apartment buildings for all the workers. Hmm. There's a school. There's a social area. There's like an indoor hall for like events and just like movie nights and things like this and like a kitchen and everything. I've never seen anything like that. 
<clears throat> all the other farms are very independent and they're all tiny. And it's like, even if you own the farm and you want to bring workers in, they'll just be like, okay, here's some wood and some nails and some like sheet metal, go build yourself a house. When we saw that and we talked to Enrique about the concept, you could tell immediately that he was intrigued and he had all these ideas because he's a very innovative guy. He likes to he likes to uh, to try things by doing them and not just, you know, constantly conceptualize about it, but just actually just go ahead and start and see where it goes. And so he was immediately intrigued. And for him, the opportunity to make a dual income from the same crop year round and employ everybody, you know, and have the community just thrive versus being very nomadic and very like peak season, low season, like to give you an idea in peak season, growing season between like December and February, there's about a thousand workers there. And then the off season from essentially March all the way to November is only about 150. So if you can imagine like that little town, that little area that he runs is like, it swells by almost eight times. (laughs) So it's pretty hectic, uh, the difference between the two seasons. And that's what we're trying to alleviate. But anyways, long story short, This is actually really cool. So we're at Enrique's farm doing the first test harvest. And there's this uh, fertilizer salesman guy who shows up. uh, It's like organic guy. And he knows that we're doing business with the first guy, Roberto, and that we shouldn't be at this farm Mm. because because we have like basically like this really loose contract we wrote up that has some form of exclusivity. And at that point, our original grower had already breached contract multiple times. And so we weren't really worried about going to another farm or like, okay, well, we got to find a way out because this guy's not going to last. And sure enough, uh, by the time we started driving back down the road to the city, we got cell reception and we got a text from our original grower who started like ripping us apart, saying we breached contract and he's he's got like military contacts. He's going to keep us in the country and like all this stuff. And we're just like, holy crap, like this is way too real right now. (laughs) And we were like, we were freaking out. Like, so that night I called some other friends of mine who have a a hotel in San Juan del Sur. And I was like, I need a lawyer like ASAP, like tomorrow morning. And they recommended these guys that were downtown in, in the capital city. And so I got in the car that that morning, the, the next morning on Friday and drove down to the capital city for a meeting and eventually like drew up some letters and all these things and went through the contract. And it was, it didn't like nothing amounted to any sort of climax at the end. We basically told them like, okay, fine. Like we'll offer you a, a bit of money to pay out the contract. And he came back with like this huge bill of like damages and all this. It was like classic, so classic American move. <laughs> But I mean, it was weird because it's like we even offered to pay it out, you know, for like yeah. the next four months. He just wanted but more. Then he huh? came, yeah. But then he came back and was like, oh, no, you owe me like six times more than that. It's like, dude, like we we put up so much equipment in your farm and you locked it up and you now you're holding it hostage and we can't even access our own equipment. And it's just like it couldn't have gone worse, basically. And for some reason, he keeps trying to add me on LinkedIn like two years or three years later. Oh, I'm sure like, now. I'm sure. <laughs> I know. So I, was, I was just so surprised by that. But anyways, just it, it, that just illustrates how complex it can be doing business in a developing country and also specifically in a different language and in, in a sector in like an ag- agricultural sector where it's very dependent on yield and the mm-hmm. biology and the weather and all these things are like all these variables and and also the cultural history of the area because you know they look at us as two like 23 and 25 year old white kids coming in with like kind of rusty spanish being like yeah we can use the leaf and they're just like what are you talking about right. we've been doing yeah been doing just the bean for like 300 years you know and for them it was like okay you're crazy but eventually we found the people to get it started and you know and then just you just can't you know kept leveling up you know it's the same thing in in everything you you don't go from like zero to 60 overnight you know in all these different aspects of the business you always have to start somewhere and then leverage it to the next one leverage it to the next one and eventually you get to that level where you know, you have a lot more clarity and scalability and, and you have like a proper, you know, roadmap that's not only just six to 12 months, but more like, you know, three to seven years at least. So when you guys first did that taste test, uh, you know, you're kind of freaking out a little bit like we hope this is pretty decent or, you know, we're kind of screwed. So how did that, that night go? And did, was everybody on agreement that, you know, this is this is pretty good stuff. This might actually work. Yeah, it was let's just say it was a huge relief. Um, it was basically like, you know, one of those aha moments where like, Oh, Oh man, I think we can do this, Mm -hmm. especially because we did it. We did it in like such a really basic way 
with like very little equipment, uh, very little consistency in the sense of like, if we were to try to do like a massive batch, it probably wouldn't be the same across the whole thing, just because the the facilities that, that with the first partner we we're working with were very limited. But it, it just gave us the indication that like, yeah, we're not crazy. You know, this this is doable and we can improve this a million times over. We know it. And so that just gave us a validation of like, OK, this is this is, uh, you know, this wasn't a waste of time. And we have so much road ahead of us, you know, which was a good thing, but also daunting as well, knowing that, OK, now you have to really do it mm-hmm. um, and you have to go out there and try to explain this to people and sell it, <laughs> which is which is a whole nother ballpark. Did you guys after that, did you actually start to package stuff, put the website up, start to get orders or did you did you still try to go around and maybe pitch some people for a little bit of funding go through some competitions to try to get some prize winnings, things like that to just kind of get those credit card bills down? Uh, so realistically, because we're launching in Canada, we had to go through Health Canada and the CFIA. And the CFIA is basically like the uh, American FDA. Mm. So the difference in Canada with food products and like consumables is that you have to go through a pre-market audit, meaning that before you even launch, you have to get approved. Whereas in the States, you can launch anything and mm. it doesn't matter until – they take notice if you like kill someone, then they'll audit you. But in our case, we have to get everything approved first. So while we were in Nicaragua, I started that process and uh, talking to the, to the Canadian government and just getting bounced around to like every single office and every single other person that was like, oh, I think this guy will know and just call him. And it's just like, oh, my God. No so one you can guys' government works the same as ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like it's OK. So I'll, I'll, in a nutshell, basically, it took about six months for them to be convinced that coffee leaf tea wasn't going to kill you. And <laughs> at, one, at one point they were like, oh, like you need to show us like recipe books from Ethiopia that have traditional Ethiopian recipes using this thing. And I'm like, dude, are you joking? (laughs) Like, I can't find that on Google Scholar. Like, it doesn't it doesn't happen. And so we had this like we had a huge pile of documents already to prove that it's been around. And I called like every single Ethiopian spice market and Ethiopian restaurant in North America. And I had at least like four or five places that had sold it uh, at some point um, in the last like couple of years at that time. And so there was like more or less proof that it's been around and that it's been known, but they didn't believe me, you know, they didn't believe us. And then eventually like we got an email back, like, I don't know, a few months after like the six months of dealing with them. So like almost nine months later and they're like, oh yeah, we finally like sat down and looked at this together as a team and you're good to go. And it's like, oh man, <laughs> wow. Like that was, it took nine months for you guys to just do a conference call and be like, yeah, you're, you're okay. Oh, my and so it was pretty it was pretty hilarious uh to get approved but in that time it gave us uh a bit of a window where we went back to vancouver or i went back to vancouver or no went back to france for a bit and do some other paperwork like get his visa for canada and things like that and then in the meantime we were just working you know had like day jobs leading up to so this at at this point is 2014 and then up until about august 2014 september 2014 I decided uh, to to break away from the agency I was working on uh, and then start focusing on Wise Monkey pretty much full time, except for some freelance contracts that I have just to kind of keep the money go- coming in. And Arnaud at that point had moved to Vancouver that summer, was kind of getting set up, was doing some like pretty like terrible sales jobs that anything <laughs> just get the bills paid, you know, and get sure. a resume going or whatever, just to get some money in the door and you know, and also, you know, kind of go through a crash course of learning English and doing sales on the fly. So it was good for him to to just jump into a really like way out of a comfort zone kind of job. So eventually, like by October, we said, OK, like, let's get our Kickstarter ready to go. And we did the Kickstarter. We got a ton of good press. The issue with the Kickstarter was that we had way too many things we were trying to accomplish with the with the goal of forty thousand dollars. And the goal itself of 40k was already too big it should have been like a 10k goal with like one thing in mind and then we do right. another one 10k goal and then maybe 20 after that and and also to realize that no one other than a few people on the street that we did that we did like uh literally like on the fly test like gorilla testimonials with other than those people like no one had tried the product before so no one has any idea if it tastes good and so we didn't fund the project. We got to about two or three, about three weeks in, 
at about, you know, 12 K out of 40. And we're like, okay, there's no way in hell it's going to finish. So we just cut it off and then open the web store, uh, the next day. And then we got like, I think 3,500 bucks in sales the next day, but it didn't, you know, you have a massive attrition rate between a Kickstarter. And then if you say, Oh no, it didn't go through, we didn't charge you, but please come to our site and buy it. Right. Not everyone's, not everyone's going to click that link. Right. Cause a lot of these yeah. things are kind of impulse. So, but yeah, that, that's kind of how it all got going. And then not long after we did a launch party at a cafe just to get a bunch of people to, <clears throat> to try and generate some testimonials and just get a bit of buzz. And then we got picked up by, uh, by a social impact incubator that then put us in the cohort for 2015. And that kind of set us up in like a proper office space, got us really thinking about formatting the, the business, you know, and, and really what is the product? What is the story? How do we actually go to market with this? And that was kind of like the genesis of like the real, you know, from like having a, a 17 kilo batch of dried tea that we couldn't even sell that much. Cause we had to like, we didn't have enough. We'd had to like sell pre-orders basically for a whole year and then eventually start selling once we got through the incubator. But that was that was the start of like between the first batch ever and then getting to like an actual incubator office space and then selling. And you're still using the same guy in Nicaragua that they're having during coffee season. They have a thousand people working there. This is it's still. A same yeah. It, yeah. So Enrique Ferrofino is a third generation coffee farmer. It's his family business, kind of a, a legacy, uh, like dyna- local dynasty in the coffee area. Mm-hmm. Um, and beyond that, like we were looking for other people. And so we contacted the Nicaraguan government, figured they'd have, you know, all the contacts you could ever want. And they recommended us. They recommended that we talk to Enrique as well. And at that time, we had we had already met him a couple of days before. And so we were like, wow, perfect. Like even the government recommends this guy, <laughs> you know. That he's like one of those innovative growers. The the ethics and the and the industry standard is just way beyond anything else in the country. And the quality, is, especially, is is incredible because he sells to like Stumptown and Counterculture and like all these major roasters. So he already knows scalability. He already knows high quality and premium. And he also speaks English, which makes the conversation, you know, and uh, and innovating and working together a lot easier. I mean, he was the holy grail of what you guys needed, pretty much. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And he still is, you know, he's still, it's, it's cool because one of the main differences between coffee growing and let's say the leaf harvesting or the tea production is that with the bean, you're, there's a few ways to process the bean. You can kind of get crafty, but at the end of the day, it's a dried bean that gets shipped to a roaster somewhere else. And then that roaster will add the value of like the final medium roast or dark roast or whatever. And then, it, and then it becomes their thing. Whereas in this scenario with the leaf, they have to dry the leaf before they ship it. And if that, if you dry the leaf, that means you, it's like drinkable and it's in its final form. So at this point they can start crafting it in a thousand different ways to make super tasty, delicious teas where every micro lot is different from the next. So for example, like Enrique will do like a, 12 hour rolling, uh, you know, Chinese style smoke tea <laughs> with, with a Hava sub varietal of Arabica coffee leaf. Like it's, a, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but it can, it can get infinitely complex and we can take it as far as we want, which is so cool because now the growers can learn all this stuff and they can differentiate themselves and create their own specialties. And now, like, if you look at the, you know, the Chinese tea industry or the Ceylon, Sri Lanka, Indian industry, they all have regional specialties they're all known for their specific things and they create so much value and demand because they have such cool, unique products that it's like, a, it's like a winery. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. the, the top end winery in Bordeaux is bottling it at the castle. They're not bottling mm-hmm. it through a, you know, they're not bottling it through like a catchment center that just does like a big blend of the area. There's are those wines out there, but this particular way of doing it adds more value, adds your thumbprint to the product. And, and so now it's like, not only is it year round income and helping stabilize the communities, they don't have to migrate. They don't, they don't have to fight the hunger in the, in the off season, their kids can stay in school, but also they're learning a whole new trade and now getting really crafty with actually how they're making the final cup taste, which is like next level for that, for that industry. That's the one thing I kind of wanted to go back to was the unintended impact, I think, of having year round employment. Uh, for the local, for local citizens there, because you said, you know, migration, hunger, education. Can you talk a little bit about the impact that's made 
that maybe you didn't even think of right initially when you you kind of wanted to do this but there's some some pretty substantial impact that happens um from year-round employment yeah i mean the way that we saw it i, I wouldn't say it was unintended because it's fully intentional it is it's more so uh like an indirect benefit is essentially like you know I think it was the average the average amount of hunger the average length of of hunger in the uh, in Latin America and the coffee regions is about three months for growers because it's towards the end of the off season where they're really just out of cash at that point and generally speaking because the growing season is really the busiest one where everyone makes the most money they're always migrating in and out of the farms on and off during the season. And when they migrate, they have to move their kids or their dad has to go somewhere else and do construction and then come back. Or the mom has to you know, find another job in the meantime. And a lot of times kids will have to move. And so like imagine imagine this, you're literally since you're a newborn baby, you're moving like twice a year. And then as you're five years old, you get into school and then you're moving schools twice a year. And by the time you're 11, you're basically always trying to keep up with courses and you're always being interrupted in your in your course flow and you're jumping into a new thing and a new thing and a new thing. All of a sudden you're like, you know what? School's not for me. I'm just not good at this. I'll never be good at it. And I'm dropping out. And that's the average age of the dropout elementary in the rural coffee communities is 11 years old. And, you know, a lot of the harvesters that we work with, they're moms that are 35 and they're going back to grade four education and they wish that they never dropped out. And, you know, it's it's like it's tough to see this in person, but it also motivates us to seriously make a difference because we know that we can. And it's you know, I'm getting goosebumps right now because yeah, me it's too. just hard. <laughs> It's like, it's, yeah, it's hard to explain because it's just like, you know, we try to show people what it's like through a video. We try to show people what it's like through Instagram photos and Mm -hmm. captions and all this stuff. But literally until you've been there and and talked to the people yourself and you see what's going on and, you know, even though they already have a, a, a better situation at Enrique's farm, the fact that we can literally change the industry. And, and now that we are, you know, bit by bit, it's just like, you know, it's really heavy, but it's also incredibly motivating. So that's what, that's really what keeps us going is to know that the more we do, the more we help, the more it creates this like holistic, you know, stability for these communities that have only known volatility and instability their entire lives. I think the, the one thing that's so important that I always, and I think this is, the absolute perfect example of social impact businesses and how by us using our consumer power have the ability to absolutely change change lives not in a uh not in like a mushy way or you know some type of fake way i mean this is real things that are happening and it's real consumer power that we have if we just shift (laughs) our dollar we spend look at look at more you know when you go buy a car right you you probably just don't go out on a tuesday and buy a car right you research you look at things but we don't really do that when it comes to you know coffee or it comes to tea or it comes to shoes or sweatshirts or hats whatever right we just kind of buy what we like and you know there's not it's more it's happening more and more now Uh, but i think this is such a great example of how if you're a tea lover (laughs) You know, you can actually buy tea and and absolutely, you know, educate children, educate mothers, employ people, you know, for year round. Um, I mean, it's just incredible, sustainable impact that can happen all from from a cup of delicious tea. (laughs) You know, so it's just uh, it's really powerful, man. And it's it just it's just a perfect example of of how our consumer power is so large. It's it's. I don't think we understand how much power we have about what we buy and, and a lot of our issues in not only our country but around the world. If we spent our per- our consumer dollars more ethically and sustainably and, and educate ourselves on how what we buy, a lot of our problems can be solved. And this is just a great just a great point of it right here. Yeah, I mean it's it's voting with your dollars, right? Totally. It's uh you know, and I, I'm not necessarily like libertarian or anything, but it's it's it becomes becomes an opportunity where if if governments can't step in and, and really make a change, and then maybe some business can. And uh, the the cool part about about our product, and I feel really 
really lucky and, and blessed, you know, mind you, it hasn't come without hard, a lot of hard work, is the fact that it, it actually just tastes so good, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. it's like, it's like, you know, in the, in the beginning, in terms of, you know, this might be helpful for a lot of people that are doing their own social impact products, especially consumable products or like a, like a hard good. In the beginning, we had, you know, our, the Simon Sinek Golden Circle was really driving all the marketing in the sense of start with why. And for us, the why was like, well, we want to change the coffee industry and, and help everybody and make sure that it, you know, it can sustain itself and, and grow, et cetera. And then the how and the what is, you know, was like, oh, well, we have this amazing tea that's really tasty, et cetera. But people saw us, they perceived us as like an NGO in the sense where the product was really an afterthought. And it was like, oh, buy this because you're helping people, not because it's really good. And so it ended up giving them this kind of, you know, weird perception that we had bad product quality necessarily, like not necessarily that, but bad product quality, uh, kind of generally speaking, and that it was just like a pity play, you know, like a like a guilt trip to buy buy it once just mm-hmm. to say that you helped out and then you never buy it again because like whatever you don't really love it and over the years we've really evolved you know and being in a being in a social impact incubator we almost got like kind of we, we were around those types of businesses so it really made us think that way and then i think once we kind of graduated out of that we also grew a lot and personally and, and professionally and we're you know started raising money and all these things and so we had to start pitching to people like to get money in the door and be like yo this is just an unbelievable product and on top of that there's an insane social impact benefit and so now you know it's 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 actually pretty topical because literally last week we went through this massive brainstorming session with some creatives and we're really trying to isolate like what is the thing, what is the benefit about this product that people can latch onto? And then as they learn more about the product, eventually the social impact story comes out and it blows everybody away. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, holy crap, this is not just like a random tea thing that's good for you and that's healthy and smooth and has caffeine. It's like, wait a sec, I can actually live a better life with this product and supplement a lot of my other coffee and other teas because it's just like an easy solution. And at the same time, know that I'm benefiting people. I'm I'm creating tangible benefit for people in Nicaragua that are living off of this and, and, you know, using those dollars and putting them towards, you know, making a more sustainable living. And, and that becomes like the kicker at the end. It also becomes the loyalty component because they know that they're part of something greater than themselves. And so like it's, you know, I challenge other founders and whoever's listening to this, if they're starting a social impact business to really take a hard look at how they frame the story and how you start the story, because in the beginning, people didn't take us seriously. And we heard this from a lot of people and we said, no, that's not how it's done anymore. It's different now. And I'll be perfectly honest. A lot of them were right. You know, consumers are selfish. Mm -hmm. They want something that they want that will they want something that they that will help them do something better. They want an, an intrinsic benefit for themselves first. And then eventually, the, the, you know, it's like the and the, people are going to hate me when I say this and I hate it, too. But Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, how many how many times have you heard that at the end of the day? It's it's true. You know, people want their own needs filled first. And then eventually you know, get to that pinnacle of the pyramid where it's self-actualization. And it's like, oh, I'm giving back now. And so if you kind of build that product story of like your your fixing it, you're solving a problem for people first, like the consumers first, and then you show them how it's done. And eventually, you know, what the effect is down the line for people that are actually harvesting it, then it's like, oh man, I can, I can enjoy this product. It's made in a really cool way. It's marketed in a cool way. And on top of that, I know I'm giving back to people. That's, that's a home run. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, I think some of the problems may be early on for, for social impact companies and, and startup brands in the space was the quality wasn't quite there yet and they kind of depended on the story to to kind of carry it right to get people to to buy certain things but now i think we're so long in the process that you know you put your product up up against a competitor right it's it's going to be top notch right and a lot of these other brands are creating products that can compete with anything on the shelf from from a product standpoint, whether it's design, usability, it works great. It's 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 the same product, but sometimes even better, right? Sometimes it's even a better product. But then also, it has this massive social impact behind it. 
For a consumer, it becomes a very easy choice. But one, we have to educate people on exactly what sort of social impact means, right? And, and why th this makes a difference in what you buy. Um, so a lot of it is education and discovery too, right? I mean, look, the internet is so massive. Like we're inundated with so much information, products every day. A lot of it is just about discovery, right? It's like, how can you get, you know, your passion product in front of people? Um, and once that happens, if you nail it on what you're talking about and, and you show the impact and you show the product is is aces, then it, it actually makes a really easy decision for consumers. But it takes a long time and hard work to get to that point. You know, when that person sees your product for five seconds and they're like, wow, this is amazing. I need to buy this. Yeah. So, you know, I think the the shift that we made from focusing on the core thing being the impact where that was the kind of story, at least as, as like the starting as like the intro to every new customer, shifting it to the actual product benefit, which has been intrinsically really hard for us because we're so close to this. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be like the thing is, like, we don't want to fall in that trap of like, oh, like drink this tea and lose weight. You know, like that's not our that's not our play at all. But you you can quickly fall down that kind of uh, that like down that spiral you know what i mean it might sell a bunch of product but at the same time you have like very uh fad consumers so for us it was like okay so how do we do this in an authentic way that actually still gets people kind of intrigued by the product and then we can start telling up the other layers of the story and getting to the deeper core of it etc and you know just that that advice that we got and and kind of ignore it and now we're putting into action it costs us a lot of money to not do that properly in the sense of lost opportunity and lost sales just by being kind of stuck almost in like too much of a social impact mm -hmm. mindset which sounds funny because it's a social impact podcast and like we're a social venture you know what i mean mm -hmm. but it sounds but at the same day like we realized that we were like too far into that side of things and people didn't take us seriously and so you know, now we're shifting it and we're realizing that, you know, the most intense like power users that we have that are drinking the tea like two, you know, two, three times a day, they're the ones going out and telling everybody what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's not the people that have bought it once because they have like a, a guilt trip about social impact and they want to support a social venture that are going out telling their friends about it because they're not drinking it every single day. And they're, they're not staying top. We're not staying top of mind with them. And if it's like, you know, think of it this think of it this way. If your friend's like, "Oh yeah, I found this company. It's really cool. I try their tea. I like it." You know, you should check them out. It's like, "Oh cool. Like, do you have any I can try?" Or like, "How often do you have it?" And they're like, "I don't know. Every like once a week, you know, or something." It's like, "Oh well, you know, it's not something that is like a game changer on the daily. So why would I change my routine? You know right. what I mean? Like coffee, especially because coffee and tea is like pretty ritualistic. You know what I mean? Very it's much, not yeah. like a, it's not like a new." like you said, like a new hat brand or like whatever, like where you can kind of buy one and, and then, you you know, next summer you buy a different one, whatever. Coffee, especially, and tea, tea is a bit more explorative, but a lot of people still like have their, their daily thing. And for us to kind of have to break those habits and change people, it really has to go through the, the benefit for the consumer and focus on, you know, showing them why it actually gives them some some intrinsic benefit over other products. And then when they become the power user, they learn about the story and then they're just like ultimate, you know, referral machines for us basically. Yeah, absolutely. What have some of the uh, the employees back in Nicaragua, have you got a chance to to chat with them and speak with them about, you know, now their their kids are able to kind of go to school full time, you know, they have a full time job. Has have you seen examples of of lives being changed on the ground when when you can talk to them? Uh, I, I wish we had more metrics around this because we don't we don't have a whole lot of uh, on the ground support other than Enrique and and his sister, but they're also traveling and they're also selling coffee, so they're not always available to do like you know so, like socioeconomic surveys basically. <laughs> but uh, but some of the simple metrics that we have uh, seen in this past year is that, uh, every single student that was in their respective course or like their class, like, you know, grade two to seven or whatever, they've all got a hundred percent, uh, attendance and, and uh, graduation rate. So at least that's a good sign. I, I don't, I, and I'll be transparent. I don't know what it was a few years ago before we started operating, but we have interviewed the teacher and she always said that like every single summer, you know, there's people that drop out because it's just not, 
it's just not doable. You know, the family needs help. They're, the kids will go out and find like odd jobs, like collecting things to sell them, whatever it may be, to try and help make money for the family or they take care of the kids so that the parents can go out and look for work. And that's the reality of things. But now we've seen that at least the attendance rate is is sky high and also the graduation rate is 100 percent. So that's a good sign. You know, I don't want to I don't want us to like rest on that and assume that, OK, it's all good because it's we still need more metrics. We still need to also learn how it is impacting people uh, beyond just being kind of theoretical and, and seeing some anecdotal res- results. Uh, I'd like to have a lot more data around that. But right now we're like strictly focused on just getting the product out the door and and trying to really grow this to to get the resources to have someone to do that, like kind of full time or at least part time. Because right now, you know, it's obviously a, a, a lean startup. We're not, you know, blowing a bunch of money on on payroll. So that's the, you know, that's one of those things where you just level up, you know, eventually you, you like, you, you know, you fight hard enough to get to that next, you know, level or you you punch through that, that wall that eventually opens up new opportunities. And that's where we are right now. And, and, you know, I really, really want to have a full-time person on the ground in Nicaragua. That's not necessarily Enrique running the farm, but someone that can focus on the media and the socioeconomic aspects and cover and getting a lot of coverage just to, uh, just to kind of, you know, help us tell that story and also learn how it is impacting people's lives beyond, beyond just some of these really simple metrics. How has the, uh, the business model maybe not changed? Cause I mean, it's probably always the same, but as far as formulating new products, doing like, you know, a membership club or loyalty program, how has, how has that growth been and, and what has worked best for you guys? What, what are your customers telling you that they want? So, for example, in the beginning, because we launched with grocery stores, we were using a lot of uh, like we're, most of our product was in tea bags, and that was fine for a grocery. But most customers wanted loose leaf. It's better value for them, and it's also easier for us to manage, and it's less costly. So, we eventually launched our tin line this past uh, fall, which we should have done a long time ago, to be honest, but we did it this past fall. And now on our website, it's about 50, 50 in terms of loose leaf and tins uh, or loose leaf, sorry, and tea bags. And so that already was like a nice kind of new format that we always wanted. And now we've gotten to that point. So we're selling that. We also launched a subscription program that, um, <laughs> to be honest, I've been so busy. I haven't even had time to even publicize it yet, but it's available. Uh, we just haven't even marketed it yet. But our goal this year is to really grow the subscription base. I've been to a lot of pitch meetings and and trying to talk to a lot of funders, uh, whether they're in technology or anything else. They're always asking us how big is our subscriber base because they know that that's really – that's really the rec- that's the recurring income. It shows the strength of a business and a brand if you have really little customers. But also, it's not just loyalty where someone is repurchasing, but if it's actually on a subscription, it just speaks volumes as to the actual power that you have and the quality of the product. Because if someone's willing to go on subscription and they get a shipment every t- every you know month or every month and a half, then it means a lot, you know. And if you have like a low churn, you know, if you're losing your 50% of your subscriptions after their second purchase, obviously it's not a very good sign. So you want to have a really robust subscription program. And beyond that, in terms of like models, now that we're doing loose leaf in like a tin format and selling a lot more product just direct and, and not necessarily relying on grocery as much, we're doing way more innovation way faster, which is something that we've always wanted to do. And now we're finally at that point where we can look at doing like one off blends and like really limited edition things mm. that uh, that in the past was like, you know, it would take a year to launch. And now it takes, you know, six to eight weeks tops. Yeah, I think that I think the uh, the idea of of a craft industry is always interesting because you could be so creative. Uh, obviously, a lot of the beer movement has been based around creativity, right? And, and brewers being able to just, <laughs> you know, play Frankenstein and just create these these wild these wild flavors and that totally. market has really just, I mean, obviously exploded and coffee to, to some extent as well, for sure. I mean, it's, they don't have as many flavors as beer and as many like specialty releases, but obviously they have, you know, a bunch of different things that, that you can try and you can, you know, especially releases for, for holidays and, and certain seasonal stuff. So do you see the tea industry doing that? I mean, the tea, it's funny cause the tea industry is, is actually so big and, it's run mostly by very old companies, but in the last 
you know, five years that we've been really going at this full time, we've seen so many new brands come up mm-hmm. and it's such, it's so refreshing to see that. And most of them are just online only because they don't like their consumers aren't at grocery stores because right. they're too, they're too, they're pretty avant-garde. They're too craft and they don't fit into like the five ninety nine a box kind of price point, which is what people expect at a grocery store. So you know, there's a lot of awesome brands that are like going farm direct now and also just getting super interesting with their blending. Like I bought this, I bought this, uh, this tea from this girl, um, her company's out of, out of Toronto, uh, Canada. And it's like, what was it? It was like dried cedar tips with a smoked Chinese tea <laughs> and, and rose petals with a few other things and I think a little bit of mint and it's like, and it's like smoky and cedary and kind of sweet and floral and all these things all at the same time. But it's just so cool. And it's so interesting to drink. Cause you're like, I've never had anything like this. And, and what I love about tea, just generally speaking is that you can have a different tea like three times a day for the rest of your life. And you still wouldn't drink all of them. You know, like there's just unlimited, variety. Whereas coffee, you know, I like a good espresso. Don't get me wrong. A proper Italian espresso tastes so good. The thing is, how many ways can you put milk in coffee? (laughs) Like the flat white. Okay, let's get real. Like it's basically a macchiato or it's basically a cappuccino or it's basically a latte or it's based. It's all the same crap. Coffee and milk and a ton of sugar, like whatever. So what I find about tea is so cool is that there's so much heritage in the way that they grow it, especially traditional teas. And then on top of that, you have all the blending that you can do with it, which is where where we're focusing now is really playing around with the blending. And so it's fun. Like you get to use ingredients from all around the world, you know, like in our, in our, uh, in our chocolate blend that we're just experimenting with right now, we're using Dominican Republic cacao shells. And, uh, the cacao shell is surprisingly super rich in like almost like milk chocolate flavor. Mm. It's like soup. It's like kind of creamy, but it has like a full on chocolate flavor. And we're mixing that with our coffee leaf. And it's like, it's almost like you're drinking hot chocolate, but you're not getting any of like all the pasty like milk aspect of it. And you're also not getting any sugar and there's no calories. Plus there's like a little bit of caffeine f- and uh, from the coffee leaf and a little bit of energy also from the theobromine that's in the cacao shell. And so it's, it's so cool because like there's just a million ways you can blend and there's a million ways you can even make the base tea on top of it. So it just never ends. You have taught me so many words. In this last 30 <laughs> seconds, like I had no idea. <laughs> Cause we, had, we just had a tea bar open like right over, right across the street from my house. And okay. I was like, I was like, you know, and it had like another, they have another one like around the corner. So there's like a ton popping up and I'm just like, man, I just never, I just never really kind of looked up and, and saw tea as this massive, massive market, but it is so huge and uh and it's uh it's pretty exciting so you know you guys are in a a great sector that's going to be continuing to grow and i think the craft market and a bunch of industries is going to continue to grow so i think this is uh it's going to be it's going to be good for you guys (laughs) the one thing i will say is i do appreciate the coffee blends with with beer so i always like like coffee stout or like coffee yes just i like the blend of of coffee and alcohol in some way so if there's a way we can do like a tea alcohol drink, that would be pretty cool. I'm sure there's people that do it, but so I always, I'm glad, I always look for I'm glad you said that. I always look for a way to like blend healthiness into alcohol a little bit. <laughs> you know, the, it, there's a – okay, so I'm glad you said that because uh, two weeks ago we launched a mango party cream ale with a local brewer here in Vancouver. And, and basically a month before that we did the brew – we did all the, we milled the grain, we created all the, you know, like the original, uh, like the wort and et cetera, all those other beer terms that I don't remember half of them. Uh, and then we steeped a couple hundred grams for 40 liters of, uh, of liquid, a couple hundred grams of our mango party coffee leaf tea into the, the brew. And then we put the yeast in it and let it ferment for about a month. And we launched it a week and a half ago at the brewery and it sold out in about 60 minutes. Mm. 
and it was so good. And so in April, we're going to do a batch. It's about 800 liters. And, um, and what I love about it is that it's like, have you ever had a shock top? Yep. Yep. So it's, it, it's shock top is like an extreme version of what we did in the sense where shock top is like tastes like there's like almost orange juice in it where right. it's like super creamy and sweet whereas ours is is much more subtle on the on the on the sweet side and it does have really nice creaminess to it because it's it's a typical cream ale recipe but has the mango flavor and the coffee leaf body that's in the in the beer itself and it's just so freaking good uh beyond that i'm I'm trying to get a hold of this company, another local brand that does uh, vodka sodas and like sugar-free vodka sodas. Oh, and I'm a, trying to – You capture my I'm heart right now. Touch, yeah. I, and they also do gin sodas too. I'm trying to get in touch with them to do a, uh, a sparkling tea canned vodka – like uh, or vodka like can kind of thing so you know I, i'm sure you've uh, heard of like hey y'alls or like uh any sort of you know spiked iced tea yep. in a can yep they're typically so much uh, sugar though you know, yeah they're like, typically tough. basement grade tea so with because the tea is so bad it makes it super bitter and so they have to add a ton of sugar to it and our tea is not bitter at all there's no tannins in it unlike traditional tea so you don't get that bitterness aspect and it has its own kind of light sweetness and still zero calories so you can add vodka to it and make it sparkling and it is absolutely insanely good and like you know you can try these things at home we have recipes on our website for a bunch of different cocktails uh, and we're actually going to be shooting some content at the end of the month here to show people how to use the soda stream to actually carbonate mm. their uh, their cold brew tea. So, lots of different ways to play around. That's what tea. That's why tea is so fun. You know, we've done a lot of like food collaborations too, where people use it as a broth, or they use the dried leaf as a um, as like a spice mix, or they'll marinate things with it. Like it just it just never ends, dude. Like that's like I what's said the, earlier. It's like, what's the name of the brewery? Uh, brewery faculty. Okay. Faculty. Yeah. Super good friend of mine, a uh, friend of ours, uh, my co-founder and I, he's the Mexican guy who's been uh, up here for a little while and they just do amazingly good beers, like super clean. They're not like hyper experimental where every beer they make is like so specific and you have to like either love it or hate it. Whereas they do like all the staples so, so well. And then when they do an experimental, it's like solid, you know, they don't mess around. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Max. Again, check them out, Wise Monkey, um, on the interwebs and social media. And hit me up if you want to learn any more about him or if you want me to put you in touch with Max and uh, talk to him about certain things if you have any follow-up questions. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Next week, if you're a big chocolate lover like I am, um, we're going to dive into the world of, of chocolate and what that industry looks like now how it's being innovated, and how we can keep it sustainable. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.